Okay, good, good evening. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. My name is Charles Small, and I'm the director of ISGAP, and ISGAP is the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. And we, as an institute, are putting on seminar series um, at various universities. Uh, yesterday we started one at McGill University in Montreal. Today, uh, Wednesdays, will be uh, events at Harvard University at the law school. Uh, tomorrow, Thursdays, are, is Fordham University. And we're also doing some events at Stanford in uh, California and in Washington. And the purpose of our institute is to create programming of high caliber scholarship, research, on issues of anti-Semitism from an interdisciplinary perspective and with a focus on the contemporary issues and contemporary challenges. Um, and I'd like to thank Professor Dershowitz for helping to lend his name. He, Professor Dershowitz is the uh, co-chair along with Professor Erwin Kotler of the Academic Advisory Board of ISGAP and his thanks to Professor Dershowitz and his good offices that we're able to, um, to be here in the law school. So thank you, Professor Dershowitz, uh, first of all. I'd like to start also, unfortunately, by offering two apologies. It's not a great way to start a, a new project at a, a very prestigious and important institution, but I have to apologize. The food this evening was supposed to be kosher, and I noticed when, I, uh, when the food came out there was actually pork being served. So there was a, a profound mistake. So first of all, I really want to offer apologies. The, the food that we have is either kosher or vegan in our events, and uh, it was something messed up tonight. So I'm very sorry for any inconvenience. And the second apology is unfortunately Professor Erwin Kotler, who's the co-chair of our academic advisory board, cannot be here this evening. He tabled a motion in the Canadian Parliament and he has to be in the parliament for the vote on his bill so and other votes uh, and on an important night in the Canadian parliament. So he's unfortunately not going to be here. So Professor Dershowitz will be here, is here. Uh, Professor Danielle Siboni from uh, Paris is here. Um, and they will speak to the, to the question tonight. So I'm going to start off, because Professor Calder's not here, I have a few extra minutes that I'm just going to kind of lay out some of the issues that ISGAP is concerned about, and certainly the question of Iran. So tonight's question of the event is, is the question, is a legal remedy to Iran's nuclear weapons program and its incitement to genocide still possible? This is the question of our time, and certainly Professor Dershowitz uh, is eminently qualified to, to engage this issue, as is Professor Siboni from a different perspective, more from a philosophical perspective. As, as you must know, Professor Dershowitz is the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law at Harvard University. He's a spokesperson for issues of justice, human rights, on so many important and key issues to American society and to international issues, and certainly a defender of Israel and somebody who has spoken out on issues of racism, including anti-Semitism over the years. Daniel Siboni is a professor of philosophy. He's also a, a, he, he has a PhD in mathematics and in psychoanalysis and philosophy. Um, he's based in Paris. He studied with people such as Emmanuel Levinas, if people know of philosophy, one of the eminent scholars, and Jacques Lacan and has been a leading uh, scholar and writer on issues of psychology, psychoanalysis, philosophy, and other issues including Judaism, the transmission of text, and also on issues of anti-Semitism and notions of the other. So he uh, was at McGill last night for a very uh, interesting and important enlight enlightening discussion. So the issue of anti-Semitism in the contemporary context, I would argue to study it, to discuss it, to speak about it, is breaking a taboo. It's breaking a taboo in the United States of America, a country that, which is perhaps the most democratic, the most free. It's a taboo that we cannot discuss. 
Professor Siboni, I think uh, last night, and he'll elaborate this evening, spoke about how our Islamophobia, our discrimination against Muslims in our society, in, in a sense, is silencing those who want to critique its rampant anti-Semitism in some societies, its sexism, its homophobia, the questions of the role of citizenship and equality in societies as, as radical Islam. I am not speaking about Muslims. I'm not speaking about Islam. I'm speaking about the rise in radical political jihadist Islamism, as we say, as it's taking over many institutions of prayer in this society, and certainly in the Middle East, it's, and I'm choosing my words carefully, it's genocidal anti-Semitism. It's incitement to exterminate Jews is front and center. It's the fuel giving rise to its social movement. And yet, in this country, we are led to believe by pundits that the Muslim Brotherhood and others are moderates. I was at a conference in Israel recently where I showed, it was in Herzliya at the IDC, at the ICT, a counterterrorism conference, where I showed Kaladari, the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, praying, leading a prayer, leading a prayer to God, leading a prayer, praying to God to allow him and his people and his movement to exterminate the Jews, Israeli Zionists and the Jews. And this is a regime, this is a social movement, which we are being told are moderates, and we have to engage. Yesterday I had lunch with people in Montreal, one Jewish colleague, an Italian-Canadian colleague, several French-Canadian colleagues, who are very much engaged in community organization in Montreal, in, in the Canadian and Quebecois context. And we were discussing the role of minorities in society, in the model of multiculturalism, which really began in Canada in the 1960s, late 60s and 70s, and the notion of interculturalism, which is based on the French re Republican model. So there, there's sort of two competing models in the Canadian Quebecois context of integrating les autres, the other, into society. And at the discussion, there was concern how do we integrate Muslim Canadians into society economically, socially, culturally with the possibility of some proponents of, in, of imposing Sharia law in segments of Muslim communities or in segments of Canadian and Quebecois society? And for these scholars of, and, and activists, uh, community organizers of different uh, ideological perspectives, if you will, we had a discussion about how to do this and, and what this, this poses to a democratic society. And it was an amazing conversation, different perspectives, but a very open, important, and I'd say fruitful conversation about how to recognize the other, integrate the other, protect the rights of all Canadian minorities and Canadian citizens. All citizens ought to be equal under one law. And about what to do with an anti-democratic issue of imposing Sharia law on Canadian society or on elements of Canadian society. When I come across the border, the conversation doesn't begin there. The conversation begins by having to prove that the Brotherhood are not Muslim, are not uh, moderates. That somehow we are being led to believe that they're moderates, there are bumps in the road, and we can continue in this dialogue between the emerging Arab Spring, the emerging democracy. What are the implications of, for example, a political convention of the Democratic Party, which has a progressive social movement, which speaks eloquently to the issue of women controlling their reproductive rights, for example, or, or the fact that any American ought to be able to marry any American they wish if they love them, that all citizens of this country ought to be equal under one legal system, regardless of gender, sexuality, religion, race, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. And the Democrats have, I would say, an agenda growing up in Canada in a social multicultural society that makes a lot of sense to somebody like me. 
But how is it that representatives of the same party then go and meet people like Morsi and have conversations behind closed doors? If I would have said two or three years ago to people that the American government would be supporting with billions of dollars of aid the Muslim Brotherhood, I think many people would think I was a little bit off the wall in my analysis. And yet, this is what's transpiring. What do we do as scholars and intellectuals to understand this very rapid, rapidly changing social reality? The world is changing, globalization, social movements. This is a complex issue in which anti-Semitism, and I would say the Jew, or the imagined Jew, as Finkelkraut argues, is somehow very much in the middle of this mix. So we have the rise of a reactionary social movement, which is using anti-Semitism, the most pernicious forms of anti-Semitism, including European anti-Semitism, the protocols and the like. And, on, and this social movement is very clear, it's articulate, it's consistent, it's open and honest, and we in the West see this as a taboo. And if anybody in certain institutions, elite progressive liberal institutions, be it in the academy or in the media, if we examine this issue, we are often, not always, but often dismissed as being advocates of defending Israel at all costs, that somehow it becomes reactionary and racist to stand up and to say there's a social movement which wants to exterminate Jews, and if we speak to it, we're breaking a taboo. We are no longer progressive. We are no longer liberal. We are racist, Islamophobic, neoconservative, and apologists for the racist entity in the Middle East. The discourse is serious. And discourse, as we know, as scholars of ideology and culture, is very important. And this also brings me to the issue of the day of Iran. The Iranian revolutionary regime has infused anti-Semitism into the public discourse globally. It uses its offices, its consulates, its embassies to propagate the most horrific forms of European anti-Semitism, the protocols, as it builds its nuclear weapons program. And the question that I have after decades after the Shoah is how is it possible that we in the enlightened West can permit the discourse on whether the West ought to or should or could stop this genocidal regime? That discourse, that question is beyond the pale. That question should not even be asked. The Western world, the United States of America, is at its best when it defends democracy and human rights and, and, and democratic principles. How can we allow ourselves to even ask the question when a regime wants to exterminate another people? And as Elie Wiesel said at Yale so eloquently, you know, he spoke about how the Iranian regime is taking the individual suicide bomber, the jihadist, the, the, the shaheed, from the individual to the national level, and that this regime is intending on killing six million Jews. Now for me to see Elie Wiesel at Yale University in front of uh, some of the finest legal scholars in the world, not the legal, the best legal scholars, <laughs> but some, to, for him to sit at Yale University several years ago and to speak about the possibility of another six million Jews being killed was one of the most horrific things to see Elie Wiesel, this scholar, rabbinical, humble, intellectual leader, to speak about this was amazing, beyond the pale. It was a horrible thing to see, that he has to live to ask this question. But he said the thing that really bothers him, as if that wasn't enough, the thing that really bothers him is the silence of the academic community, the silence of the students, the silence of the Jewish community leadership, and the silence of the leadership of the free world. That's what really bothers him. And I think as scholars, and I hope, I hope as ISGAP begins to reestablish ourselves at fine institutions, and we have a, an amazing lineup of scholars who are coming to Harvard Law School every few weeks, and the same in Montreal, McGill, and New York, and in Stanford, 
that I hope that this will inspire scholars and students to really begin to ask this question, to study it, to understand it, to unpack it, to decode it, to map it. And maybe if we begin to really understand it through high caliber analysis and research, we can then inform policy. We can inform intelligent policy to engage this issue, to, to deal with this issue. We can inform courses and curriculum and books and, and journalists to really begin to examine this openly, to debate it. And if people don't agree with what I said tonight, fantastic, wonderful. But come out to the pub with me and argue with me. Tell me what articles I should be reading that I haven't demonstrated any awareness of. And I'll give you a few articles to read. And come back and continue the debate. But we cannot be silent. If we've learned one thing from the history of anti-Semitism, we cannot afford to be silent. And on that note, it is really a, a profound honor and privilege to introduce you to Professor Dershowitz. Thank you. I hope this will take the form of a conversation rather than a lecture. I tore my meniscus, so I'm going to have to sit through the conversation. I hope you'll excuse me. And um, I don't want to apologize for Erwin Cutler because he is doing very, very important things. And he is, uh, as you know, one of the most remarkable people on the face of the earth. Every year I nominate him for a Nobel Peace Prize and write about how what a major role he has played in bringing about the rule of law and the rule of human rights uh, to the world. I'm always uh, honored when I go up to Canada and I'm introduced as the American Erwin Cutler, or when he comes down here and he's introduced as the Canadian Alan Dershowitz. We were truly born joined at the hip. And as you probably know, we're the, the dearest of friends and colleagues and we've worked together now. It'll be almost 45 years since we met in New Haven and have continued to work together on these uh, projects. Um, uh, I um, spoke to him today and he asked me if I would summarize his views in addition to my own because he will be absent today. And so although I will not try to imitate his Montreal uh, accent, um, uh, he said he was going to speak about uh, 10 minutes. And uh, so I will try to summarize his views and then uh, get to my own, which, believe it or not, are a little different. They're uh, supplementary uh, to, to his uh, views. Uh, Irwin really and truly believes in the rule of law and in the power of the law to confront um, evil. I'm a little bit more of a realist and uh, uh, a critic and uh, not so sure, but uh, uh, let, let me tell you what Irwin has done. He's absolutely remarkable. You know, when Anatoly Sharansky was imprisoned, Irwin said we can free him through the rule of law, and he produced uh, a thousand-page brief, uh, which I helped with, but really only helped with. And sure enough, we were able to, to free uh, or help free uh, Sharansky and many other uh, Soviet dissidents. Now he has authored a multi-page brief uh, indicting Ahmadinejad and the Iranian leadership for the crime of incitement to genocide. He has uh, taught us that incitement to genocide is the only inchoate crime. Inchoate means non-completed crime, like attempt or conspiracy, but the only crime that is not yet completed, on the way to being completed, that is recognized by international treaties and charters. It is a crime against humanity to incite a genocide, and let there be absolutely no doubt that the Iranian regime is inciting uh, genocide. You heard from uh, Professor Smollett some of the quotations, uh, and there are uh, many, many uh, others, and I do want to commend this great institution that is being built around the world uh, to study this phenomenon, not only of incitement to genocide, but generally of the increase of anti-Semitism as a weapon in the war against Israel and in a continuing war against the, the Jewish uh, people. But if you look at what um, the regime in Iran has said and done, you'll see that the case for incitement to genocide is a very compelling one. All these quotes come from Erwin Cutler's writing 
And of course, I trust Irwin because he's a meticulous researcher. Uh, he quotes repeatedly leaders uh, of the Iranian mullah and the Iranian regimes as calling not only for the destruction of Israel and for the destruction of Zionism, but for the destruction of the Jewish people. Uh, in 2002, the website of Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei declared in February of that year that there is a religious, quote, justification to kill all the Jews and annihilate Israel and Iran must take the helm. Uh, there are many, many other quotations that one could give if you really want to have a terrible evening listening uh, to them. Uh, I'll just mention a, a couple of others that come from uh, uh, Hezbollah's head Nasrallah, who is, of course, a wholly owned subsidiary of Iran. Nobody claims that Nasrallah is independent. He is run by Iran. He is a co-conspirator with Iran, and his views under international law as well as domestic law are attributable to Iran. Many of you know that he infamously said that uh, he was essentially a Zionist because he hopes that all the Jews of the world will ingather and come to Israel because he said if they all do that, quote, it will save us the trouble of going after them worldwide. So this is not only about Israel. This is about you, your friends, your relatives. This is about an attempt to export genocide uh, from the Middle East uh, all over the world. Now you might say this is just some blowhard speaking. Uh, people said that about other blowhards in the past. Uh, as Elie Wiesel famously said that for him, the greatest lesson of the Holocaust was always believe the threats of your enemies more than the promises of your friends. And there have been many promises made by our friends and we hope they will be kept, but there have been many threats made by our enemies and we know that if they have the power to carry them out, they will do so. In fact, no Iranian leader who had the capacity to carry out the threats and didn't carry them out could survive. Right now, the only reason that Iranian leaders could survive without trying to annihilate Israel or the Jewish people is they don't have the capacity to do it. If they had the capacity, imagine the pressure from within that community, if there is a religious justification for killing the Jews, not following that religious obligation, it would be regarded as heresy and, and blasphemy. So the threats have to be taken very, very seriously. And Erwin Cutler has laid out the juridical remedies that exist for incitement to genocide and they include the following, referring the genocidal incitements to the UN Security Council for accountability and sanctions, initiating an interstate complaint against Iran, also a state party to the Genocide Convention, which does prohibit incitement to genocide before the International Court of Justice for its standing violation of the convention, calling upon the UN Secretary General to refer the situation in Iran to the US Security Council as one threatening international peace and security pursuant to Article 99 of the UN Charter, or requesting the Security Council to refer the matter to the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, which can indict Iranian leaders as it has uh, others. Uh, I actually went to see the Chief Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court and took with me Erwin uh, Cutler's brief and formally presented it to him uh, on behalf of Erwin Cutler and, uh, and he read it, he called in his chief assistants, um, he asked me to summarize it, I summarized it, and they uh, agreed that certainly a prima facie case was laid out for incitement uh, to genocide. Up to now nothing has happened. Um, Irwin has reliance on the rule of law. I'm a little bit more cynical about uh, the UN Security Council the International Court of Justice, which is not international, it is not a court, and it has nothing to do with justice. It's not international because, of course, it excludes Israel uh, from its uh, membership. It's not a court because its members are appointed by the government, and as Professor Posen approved in an article that he wrote several years ago, virtually every vote cast by many of the members follow phone calls to their embassy or phone calls to their capital asking how to vote and it has nothing to do with justice because it applies a double standard. So uh, here I'm not paraphrasing my friend Erwin Kala, I'm speaking for myself. 
But the idea that the UN Security Council with the veto by uh, the Soviet, by Russia, would permit any of this to go forward is, I think, an illusion and a dream. And nonetheless, I agree with Professor Cutler that it should be tried. It should be tried for a lot of reasons. And here's where I get into my part of the talk. Um, I think in the end, the only way the law can work and the only way sanctions can work is if they are backed up by a credible military threat. Let me give you one reason why sanctions won't work. There are now sanctions against Iran. Do you know that, you, that Harvard is about to break those sanctions? I was just tonight walking in, uh, given by Rabbi Hershey Zarki, something I was not aware of, that the uh, Harvard Museum of Natural History is offering a, a trip to wonderful Iran, uh, where people can see the beautiful spheres and the beautiful, a country of searing beauty. Um, and um, if this trip is allowed to take place, and I will do everything in my power to prevent it from being sponsored by Harvard, it means that Harvard University and people working in the name of Harvard University will be essentially sending money to Iran. Whether this technically violates American sanctions, I don't know. But I can tell you in spirit it does. It reminds me a little bit of how many trips uh, Harvard academics took to Berlin in 1933, 1934, 1935, 1936, 1937, 1938, up through 1939. This is wrong. And those of you who are students at Harvard, those of you who access to the Harvard Crimson, uh, ought to make sure that the Harvard University community is aware that the museum is sponsoring a trip that will help finance the Iranian regime and will set a precedent for other good institutions and other good universities to help finance this horrible regime. There is sanctions, and those sanctions ought to be complied with in spirit by a great uh, university. The sanctions are being broken all over the place. Sweden breaks the sanctions, China breaks the sanctions, Russia breaks the sanctions. You know, it's like the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, the, the sanctions are there for smart lawyers to figure out ways to get around them. Uh, and um, the sanctions are having some effect. They're having some effect on making poor Iranians poorer, uh, on having an impact on the average Iranian, but they're not having any effect, zero, zero, zero effect on Iran's decisions to build nuclear weapons. And if sanctions and diplomacy are left alone without a credible military threat, Iran will develop nuclear weapons. They may not make the last decision to move from high quality capacity to weaponize to the actual decision to weaponize, but if they ever do, we won't know it because that's an invisible decision, unlike the purification process, which is visible from satellite. The process of weaponization, as Benjamin Netanyahu put it at the United Nations, my wife and I were there at his invitation when he spoke and did this famous drawing with the, with the bomb. He made it clear, and he was absolutely right, and I've seen nobody criticize this, that the decision to move from high quality to weaponization is a decision that will take only a matter of weeks and could be done in small little workhouses around Tehran, underground, uh, around the countryside, and nobody would ever know it. So the idea of waiting until they actually put the final touches on their weapon is an invitation to a disaster, and I hope it won't be allowed to carry out. So for me, the idea is how to make sanctions work and how to make diplomacy work by sending the following message to the Iranian leadership. And this is a message that should be sent by the President of the United States, regardless of who he is, uh, over the next uh, weeks and months. Uh, and this is a bipartisan issue. Uh, the President of the United States ought to stare the mullahs in the eye and say, look, why are you hurting your own citizens? Why are you incurring the pain of sanctions and diplomatic isolation? you will never be allowed to develop nuclear weapons. When we say we have kept the military option on the table, let me explain to you what that means. What that means is we will bomb you. We will destroy your nuclear capacity if you get close to making nuclear weapons. Forget about red lines. This is a black and white line. You cannot develop nuclear weapons. Some people say we, the United States, can't destroy your capacity for more than five years. Well. If we do, and if you rebuild in five years, we'll be back. We have the capacity to bomb you again, and again, and again. 
without putting a single troop on the ground, without putting a single boot on the ground. We can use our technological advantage, our drones, our tomahawks, our birds in the sky, and make it impossible for you to develop nuclear weapons. So why are you making your people incur the pain of sanctions? Only if the Iranians absolutely believe that will the sanctions work. Do they believe it today? Absolutely not. Why not? Because the administration and all government of the United States is speaking with multiple voices. Uh, Robert Gates says, no, 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 military option is off the table and should be off the table. By the way, some Israeli uh, leaders, generals, and former intelligence officers are also saying, Dagan, that's, that uh, military option should be taken off the table. He hasn't quite said that, but it's been interpreted uh, to mean that by at least uh, some, some people. Uh, so the credible threat has not been maintained. And I can tell you now, and I know this for a fact, the Iranians do not believe that the United States means it when it says it. I believe that the President of the United States means it. When he sat down with me, he invited me to the Oval Office, and we sat down for 40 minutes, and he looked me in the eye and he said, Alan, I've known you a long time. I don't bluff. When I say the military option's on the table, it's on the table. I believe that, but I don't believe the Iranians believe that. And it's not important what I believe. It's only important what really two parties believe the Iranians and the Israelis. Because if the Israelis don't believe the Iranians believe it, they will have to take action on their own. And that would not be a good thing for Israel. It would not be a good thing for world peace. It may be a necessary thing, but it would be much more desirable if Iran took the threat seriously. As George Washington said, essentially, in his second inaugural address, the best way to prevent war is to make your enemy know you're ready to wage it. And we have to make the Iranians, this is coming from a peace lover, somebody who doesn't want the military option to be used. And as somebody who doesn't want the military option to be used, it is absolutely essential that the Iranians believe the military option will be used. And that means the military option might have to be used. But I believe there's a high likelihood it wouldn't have to be used if, in fact, the Iranians come to believe that it would be used if they would have developed nuclear uh, weapons. Now, would that be legal? Would Erwin Cutler approve? I think he would. Um, and there are various bases for why, under international law, the threat to use the, the military option, and in fact the use of the military option, would be acceptable under the law. First of all, Iran has already attacked both the United States and uh, Israel. It attacked Israel when it attacked the Israeli embassy in Argentina. It attacked the United States just today. There was a plea of guilty in the federal court in New York for trying to kill the, the ambassador from Saudi Arabia um, in Washington, D.C., and putting at risk uh, many, many American lives at a restaurant. So it is already engaged in acts of war against the United States. Uh, it was responsible for Hezbollah's destruction of American Marines back years ago. So there's already, causes belli, there's already acts of war under Article 51 of the United Nations. This would be a reactive, not a preventive or a preemptive strike. Now, all reactive strikes are also preventive in nature. You pick targets that are essential to preventing further damage. But that's one basis. Second, they have provided weapons, including drones, to Hezbollah, which have been used against uh, Israel. And those are acts of war justifying a military response. Third, they have engaged in incitement to a genocide. Uh, fourth, they have made express threats against Israel. Fifth, they have been developing nuclear weapons, which they have said they would use against Israel. And this is not the very, very conservative people in the current Mullah regime, but Rafsanjani, who's supposed to be the liberal and the moderate, uh, he said in an interview picked up by the Washington Times that if Iran developed nuclear weapons and used them against Israel, it would destroy Israel because Israel is, quote, a one-bomb country. All it needs is one bomb in Tel Aviv, and that's the end of the Zionist experiment, the end of Israel, and the end of you know, many, many millions of Jews. And he said, we would kill five million Jews by dropping a nuclear bomb, three to five million Jews. Israel would retaliate by dropping a bomb on Tehran, killing 10 to 20 million Muslims, but the trade-off would be worth it because there are still 100 million Muslims left in the world, and this would really put an end to uh, Jewish domination of the world. When you have a leader saying that, um, then obviously a country has to take that very, very seriously. And uh, as Dean Acheson 
put it once, who was our former Secretary of State, a nation's survival will never depend exclusively on the rule of law. So even if the law raised some questions about it, and I think it does not, and it does not because the United Nations a few years ago appointed a commission of jurists to look at Article 51. Article 51 says the right of a nation to engage in self-defense shall not be abridged by this uh, charter uh, against armed attack. And if you read the statute literally, as Justice Scalia might, uh, you would read it as saying first an armed attack must occur. But this commission of jurists was asked to look into what it really means in the context of nuclear threats, etc. And the commission was headed by a former foreign minister of, our, of, of Australia and a whole bunch of other prominent diplomats and jurists. And they came to an interpretation of Article 51, which said, A, preemptive attacks are justified. So what Israel did in 1967 is justified under Article 51. But then it said, what about preventive attacks? And what about preventive attacks on nuclear weapons that were being threatened to be used against a country? And they came to the conclusion that there's nothing in the law which would prohibit a preventive attack against the use of nuclear weapons. But certain steps had to be taken first. You had to first exhaust all your legal remedies. So you had to go to the Security Council first. Uh, or you had to be assured that the Security Council wouldn't give you any remedy. And of course, that is clear. Uh, the Security Council would not uh, uh, give Israel uh, what was necessary to protect it against Iran. Second, you have to try to do it multilaterally. And Israel has tried to do that through the United States. Israel is not a member of NATO. Uh, Turkey is a member of NATO. That's a scandal and should not continue. Uh, Turkey's membership in NATO should have been conditioned on Israel's membership in NATO because today, as you know, Turkey is now technically an ally of the United States, and yet Turkey is engaged in acts of war against Israel. And if Israel were to retaliate against Turkey, that would technically be an attack on the United States. And that's an absurd, absurd state of affairs. And whoever is elected president, that ought to change. Israel ought to be admitted into NATO. Turkey ought to not be allowed into NATO unless Israel is admitted into NATO as, as well. But, um, but uh, if Israel does satisfy, or the United States, all the conditions, then a preventive attack would be justified, even under the interpretation, the authoritative interpretation of Article 51, which was set out by the United Nations. Now, the response to that is, well, um, you know, maybe Iran wouldn't use its nuclear bomb against Israel, and maybe it wouldn't. Um, who knows? Um, and the question is, what degree of likelihood is enough uh, for a country? And um, what if it's only 20% or 30%? What was the likelihood that the Soviet Union was going to use nuclear weapons in Cuba against the United States? Probably less than 1%. The United States wouldn't accept that risk. And it engaged in an act of war. A quarantine, a blockade is an act of war. And it threatened the Soviet Union and said, we will stop you from bringing weapons into the sovereign nation of uh, Cuba. And uh, Cuba backed down, and a deal eventually was made. And remember that Israel faces threats in addition to perhaps the unlikely threat that Iran would actually try to drop a nuclear bomb in the middle of Tel Aviv. By the way, I wouldn't minimize that possibility. We are talking about a suicide nation. We're talking about a nation that sent tens of thousands of its 14 and 15-year-old children to certain death in the last years of the war against Iran, giving them tokens to uh, paradise. And we know that the Iranian regime has murdered uh, over 100,000 of its own dissidents uh, over the uh, last several years. And of course there are no gays in Iran. They're executed. Uh, and a country willing to do that to its own population is certainly presents a high risk of suicide. But even being a suicide nation, willing to accept a bombing of, of Tehran. By the way, would Israel bomb Tehran? Menachem Begin, when he bombed the Osiric nuclear reactor, said, no, Israel doesn't engage in tit-for-tat retaliation. He said, we are not at war with the children of Baghdad. No Holocaust survivor nation like Israel could ever order the incineration of a million uh, Iraqi children. That's why Israel has to act preventively. That's why it goes only after military targets. That's why it's the only nation in history that has never deliberately attacked civilian targets, never deliberately attacked a city. Uh, when Israel was bombed in 1948 by the Egyptian Air Force and the first attack was on the bus station in downtown Tel Aviv, a civilian target, Israel did not retaliate by bombing downtown uh, Cairo. In 1967, 
When the war with Jordan began by 1,600 rockets being sent into downtown Western Jerusalem, Israel didn't retaliate by attacking the Jordanian cities, Amman. It retaliated by attacking military uh, targets. So Begin said, Israel always attacks military targets preemptively or preventively. That's its way it wages war because it does not believe in massive retaliation against civilian targets. It does not believe in the Russian, the Soviet system of mutually assured destruction. It has to take preventive action, and yet it's condemned for taking preventive action, yet preventive action saves more civilian lives than deterrence. Imagine if we had to use deterrence against the, the Soviet uh, Union. But uh, a nuclear bomb is not the only threat, at least a bomb dropped on Tel Aviv. Dirty bombs, dirty bombs given to Hezbollah or Hamas, which could be put in suitcases and sent into uh, Israel or the United States, into Boston Harbor, New York Harbor, Charleston Harbor, Miami Harbor, all of that is uh, possible. Uh, creating a nuclear umbrella under which Hezbollah and Hamas could spread its terrorism with the threat of nuclear retaliation if Israel were to preemptively attack and try to destroy Hezbollah's 50,000 rockets. Um, the proliferation that would occur if Iran developed a nuclear bomb, immediately Egypt and Saudi Arabia and who knows what other countries would have to develop uh, nuclear weapons, there'd be an arms race. It would be the end of nuclear non-proliferation, which has been a hallmark of this administration's uh, regime. And uh, finally, the threats. Living under a threat of nuclear annihilation would result in possibly massive Yurida, the opposite of Aliyah, massive emigration from Israel to other countries in the world. So yes, um, an Iranian nuclear weapon is an existential threat, and I'm sorry, uh, head of Israeli intelligence, Dagan, and I'm sorry, former leader of, of the Israeli military, you're dead wrong when you say that Iran does not pose an existential threat. I, as a civilian with no expertise in the military, am telling you, generals, you're wrong. You don't understand the word existential. An Iran with nuclear weapons is an existential threat. There were people who said that Germany, in violation of the Versailles Treaty, didn't pose an existential threat. Just remember, this is a very important lesson of history. If Winston Churchill had been elected instead of Chamberlain in 1936 or 1937, and he had stead instead of George or Joe, war, 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 and he had done the right thing and gone to war against Hitler in 1936 and 1937 and killed Hitler and Goering and Goebbels and the entire Nazi regime and in the process killed 10,000 uh, German civilians, history would have treated Churchill horribly. They would have said, my God, look what you did. After humiliating Germany in the First World War, after humiliating them with the Versailles Treaty, just because they violate the Versailles Treaty, what did you do? You killed 10,000 people because there was some tin horn dictator who was talking about killing Jews, who was writing a book called Mein Kampf? He never would have done it. That's the way your professors of history would have treated Winston Churchill because no historian can ever look back and say, what if? What are the contingencies? And when Carolyn and I, my wife was here today, recently we had dinner with Benjamin Netanyahu and Sarah in New York uh, on the Friday night that they delivered their his speech to the UN, and I, um, uh, because it was Friday night, I decided to do a little bit of a Dvar Torah, uh, a, a word from the Bible, and I used some biblical verses to illustrate the story about Winston Churchill. Uh, he came over to me afterward and said, you know, he never thought about it that way. Uh, and that it's important to understand, I said to him, Prime Minister, that if you ultimately decide you have to make the decision to go after Iran, you may be treated badly by history, too. You may be treated badly by your own countrymen and by uh, others. You have to have the courage to do the right thing, just the way Churchill should have had the courage to do the right thing. You can make the mistake by going to war when war shouldn't be an option, and you can make the mistake of not going to war when war should be an option. We tend to see the former more easily because it's more visible. We tend not to see the latter because it's less visible. But anybody who thinks these things through in a rational way has to understand the potential risk of omission in addition to the potential risk of act. Um, Professor Mark Hauser wrote in his book on morality that all human beings instinctively think that acts are more culpable than omissions. 
Uh, that may be what the human instinct is, but it's not the right approach. Uh, any rational decision-making analysis understands that omissions can be as dangerous and as culpable as acts. And so my hope is that wise leaders will do wise things and will act accordingly, uh, that the approach that uh, Robert Gates has taken, which if any, if Iran does develop nuclear weapons, the man who would have a statue built to him in Tehran would be Robert Gates, the worst Secretary of Defense in modern history. The worst Secretary of Defense, the man who issued the so-called intelligence report, the dumbest intelligence report in modern history, which back several years ago said, don't worry about Iran, they're not even thinking about developing uh, nuclear uh, weapons, uh, and the man who has urged the United States to take the military option off the table and to allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons. That's his position, and he's very influential, very influential at places like the Kennedy School, very influential in uh, places around the country, and he's just dead wrong. I mean dead wrong, because he is putting at risk the safety of the world, the safety of the United States, and the safety of uh, Israel. So my hope is that the rule of law will prevail. My hope is that Iran can be defanged without the need for a military option to be used, but the only way that can happen is if within the rule of law, a credible military option is communicated to Iran. Only if Iran understands that we mean it, that we really don't bluff, that they will not be allowed to develop nuclear weapons, will they back away the way Iraq backed away from using chemical weapons when we threatened to go to the dark side and use nuclear weapons against their chemical weapons. Those threats work and those threats have to be used, they have to become part of American policy. And I'm hoping that whoever is elected, uh, and this is not a political campaign or a partisan uh, uh, event, but whoever is elected will understand that that credible threat is essential to preserving peace within the rule of law. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Professor Dershowitz. It was an amazing and important analysis on a crucial issue. Thank you. And now, Professor Daniel Siboni, please take the stage. You, you can sit or stand as you wish. Well, I uh, first apologize for my broken English. I was supposed to react, to listen to the discussion between you and your friend, and to react. Uh, uh, so uh, it's a, a bit different. I, I put some remarks about uh, uh, some points of your brilliant uh, analysis. You have quoted uh, Mr. Kamini saying that uh, there are religious reasons to justify massive killing of Jews. Mm -hmm. It's true that he has said that, but uh, pitifully, it is true that there are religious reasons. I have read the Quran very carefully. I wrote a book about the three monotheisms uh, and their relation to their origins, to their texts, and uh, of course, in, in the Bible, in the Jewish Bible, there is a great deal of violence. But it is uh, mainly directed against Jewish people. Very rarely against the goyim, uh, they are too far, and uh, it's not the purpose. Uh, in the 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 text of Quran uh, lends itself to 
lectures, interpretations mm -hmm. that uh, are uh, consistent to support the idea that uh, uh, Jewish people it makes no sense that the existence of Jewish people has been uh, a, a, a solved problem by the building of the new identity, of the new Islamic identity. Mm -hmm. that, uh, so that the, uh, when, they say, when they say there are religious reasons, uh, it's true in their point of view. That is, the, the, there, uh, there is a really uh, uh, a lecture and interpretation of the text, because the, the text, for instance, says that uh, almost all Jews, all the Jews, are perverse. Almost all. Uh, you can have a fundamentalist that read the text and uh, decide with others, and if they have the power like in Iran, they really feel justified. People have to know that. <laughs> this is the, uh, the big contradiction that the uh, Western world is facing. It is how to help this identity to solve its problems with uh, its uh, origins and its fundamental text. You could say there are a lot of uh, moderate Muslims. Uh, of course, there are a lot of Muslims that, that uh, hate that kind of lecture, uh, lecturing the text of Quran. But when an event occurs, for instance, the caricatures in France. I read papers uh, from intellectuals, Muslim, moderate intellectuals, who said, first, liberty of speech is a sacred right. So you feel quiet. It's possible to to speak freely. But they add, why that newspaper has added oil on the fire? But uh, to add oil on the fire is an expression in, Fran in French to, see, to say that uh, when there is fire, you, you come with water, not with oil. It means, uh, but, uh, it is justified when there is a when a fire breaks in a building, but when you have a lot of people inflamed since uh, many many centuries, and if this uh, fire this flame is permanent, if you ask to shut up, it means that you accept. And there is in France a deep silent, violent censorship about that. You cannot uh, analyze in a critical way the, this transmission, this tradition. And even if you say that it uh, allows the right of killing uh, a people, you are attacking it. You are, you can be accused of stigmatization. <laughs> so the problem is uh, a bit complicated. But uh, I really admire your enthusiasm, <laughs> your uh, uh, feeling of uh, being convinced. You are really convinced that law can be enforced. I sincerely admire that position. And in the same time, at the same moment, I know that uh, uh, 
human behavior uh, does not follow mm -hmm. that way. That, for instance, your argument is perfect. And of course, there will be a lot of uh, people who will say, well, you are right, but uh, don't you feel it's, it's strange that uh, America has uh, to, to open, to begin another war just to defend Jews? to defend Israel, you are, you are fighting, you are uh, just a Zionist, that you are fighting for your uh, country or your religion or your people, and we are fed up of that. We want, we want some calm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, now I speak as a psychoanalyst. Uh, there are pulsions of life, sexual pulsions, desire, uh, contradictions, uh, 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 impulsions to, to invent, to create, to, to fail, and to win. But there are other pulsions, pulsions of conservation. That is, someone, you can, you can prove to him that he is wrong. He, you can prove to him that he has to make this choice. This is the, the most honest choice. But if this uh, is problematic for him, for instance, if, if in his university uh, there is a fa financial pressure and uh, uh, massive pressure to, to forbid a symposium or a discussion about this problem, he will say, uh, well, uh, you are right, but uh, it will create a mass a situation, difficult situation. Don't put me in that uh, difficult position, please. If, and if you insist, he becomes aggressive. And he becomes, he can become so aggressive that actually he joins the other position. Because the other position means simply, we don't want that Jewish people who is a disturb to our text, to our tradition, to our faith. And uh, this is exactly the position of a teacher, of a pro professor of a university that can uh, fire you out if you insist in, uh, to discuss that kind of problems. Or this is the position of a journalist uh, who will refuse your uh, article about that uh, problems because uh, you create problems. So you, we, you have to take in consideration what is called death pulsion. Death pulsion are not pulsion to die, just pulsion to conserve the situation. Don't change. No break. No problems. But Jewish people is a problem. And for this, I love it. <laughs> because I think that a people who writes a book, and that book is his book, his holy book, which says so bad, so many bad things about him, and who writes so many laws, beautiful laws, and he says, look at that laws, we are unable to fulfill them. but we maintain our link to them. We love that stake. Well, it's a very singular people. But maybe this singularity is universal because I think every man has that kind of attitude. Everybody could accept, submit to the order to the routine of his life, to, 
to the, the need of no contradictions, just plain behavior. But it occurs a moment where uh, the pulsion of life uh, compels him to enter in contradiction with himself and to fight with himself and to write against himself. And this is exactly what uh, Jewish people has done in that bloody book, his Bible. It is uh, an identity uh, ca uh, uh, card which is very strange because it's full of contradiction, of possibilities, and of a, a tie to the being which is a, a war of love. That is a war where the other has not to be killed where just it is exactly the symbol of the fight between Jacob and the other. It is a, a unique uh, fight because if one of the two says, well, I don't leave you unless you bless me. If you have uh, wars with uh, friends and you can say them, I don't leave it unless you bless me. Mm -hmm. You integrate that kind of contradiction. But I insist, I totally agree with your mm -hmm. uh, reasoning. <laughs> really. Good, thank you. But, uh, and I find it, I, I would not say like your, uh, your colleague that uh, I believe that law is able to confront the evil. I don't think so. I never saw that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I never saw. Sometimes it happens, but usually law, especially in our culture, law is, is used to maintain the space of the game. Yeah. So that everybody can play. Of course, we are now in a situation of crisis where one player wants to kill another player. That is, want to, to break the play. Mm -hmm. So it is a situation to enforce that law. You are right, totally right, to, to ask from your president just to make it uh, uh, credible. That it, to make right. it credible that they will stop. But you have to know that it will be very, very, very difficult uh, because it will raise, because I could ask you, why hasn't he already said that? Mm -hmm. it's a good this question. is one question. It's a good question. Please. Okay. Well, first of all, I think he has come close to saying it. And well, let's first of all. Uh, I'm not used to having people agree with me and I'm hoping there'll be some questions from students that will disagree perhaps with me or with both of us. But just to answer that question very quickly, um, I and others have been pressuring the president um, to say this um, and he has moved in that direction. He explicitly took containment off the table, put the military option on the table and has publicly stated that uh, the policy of the United States is not to allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons. Even after he said that, I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal after he made that statement saying, I wish he'd go just a little bit further, and I wish he'd make sure that everybody in his administration followed along with that policy, and that way increases the credibility. And it's a work in progress, and I hope that he will move in the right uh, direction. But I'm hoping also we'll get some maybe critical yeah. perspectives Can from I? particularly students. I'm um, going to call first, if, if I may, uh, I'd like to call on first on Chuck Freelach from the Kennedy School and from the uh, IDC, Tel Aviv University, who will also be convening some of the seminars here at the uh, law school for ISGAP. So, Chuck. Good evening, everyone. As 
Charles indicated. I have some minimal role in helping to put this uh, evening together, but I really wanted to take the opportunity to ask everyone to join me in thanking Charles for initiating this. I just wanted to make one comment, and it's a comment uh, not as someone from the Kennedy School, but as someone who spent his whole life in the Israeli defense establishment uh, since leaving it a few years ago, writing about Israeli defense issues. And that is, yes, we face what may, may be an existential threat. There's a debate in Israel whether this is truly an existential threat or just a dire one. Well, even if it's just dire, it's bad enough. <laughs> but I feel a little uncomfortable when we talk about these issues in terms of the Holocaust, or continually make comparison analogies, historical analogies, because there are, there are similarities and they are very worrisome. There are numerous differences and I want to know just one of them. And it's a three-letter difference, that's all it is, but it is, as they say in Hebrew, or Lamed, it is an entire world of difference. And the difference is, the IDF, or the Israel Defense Force. And of course. That's why it will never, in the end, be an existential threat. Well, I, I wish I could agree with you completely. I, I agree that that is the major difference. And, you know, thank goodness for that. Israel has the ability to defend itself. And although it never has admitted it, it has certainly upward of 30 or 40 uh, nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, the reason it's an existential threat is that Israel has the capacity to use nuclear weapons, but nuclear weapons will only be used too late. Um, uh, Israel has promised the world, while not admitting it as nuclear weapons, that it would never be the first to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East. So by definition, that means Israel would only use a nuclear weapon to retaliate uh, against presumably a nuclear attack. And I never thought I'd have myself agreeing with Rafsanjani but he's right about Israel being a one-bomb country. If, God forbid, there were a nuclear bomb ever dropped on Tel Aviv, it would be the end of Israel. It wouldn't mean that every Israeli would be killed, but it would make large portions of Israel uninhabitable uh, for generations to come, and it would result in Israelis uh, leaving. I don't know what an existential threat means if that's not it. Um, I agree with you, Israel has the ability to defend itself, and that's why comparisons with the Shoah are often inapt. Uh, but historical comparisons are always imperfect. Um, and, but I think you're absolutely right. Every time there's a discussion of the 1930s, the point has to be made that the 1930s wouldn't have occurred um, the way they did if there had been an Israel Defense Force. I debated Peter Beinhardt two nights ago at City College and Peter Beinhardt in his book, The Crisis of Zionism, condemns Jewish leaders who have a photograph in their office of the Israeli Air Force flying over Auschwitz. And I told him in the course of the debate, I have that photograph in my office, signed by the head of the Israeli Air Force. And it's a very important uh, photograph because it says, not about the past, it's about the future. It's a statement that Auschwitz will never again occur because Israel has the capacity to prevent it and stop it. But that's in dealing with rational players. And Robert Gates thinks that Iran are rational players. By the way, so does Dagan. Um, and you know, I, I love criticizing people who are head of the Shimbet or head of the uh, Mossad or head of the <laughs> FBI or head of the CIA uh, because over time um, they have been wrong so often. Uh, and Dagan is just totally and completely wrong. Uh, about what he's saying. Um, by the way, he's been misquoted about what he's saying. He doesn't quite go to the length. Um, and you know, the people say, but he said it on 60 Minutes. Let me tell you why I never go on 60 Minutes. Uh, 60 Minutes manages to interview you for six hours and use 13 seconds of the most damaging things you've said in order to make the point they want to make. Uh, I just advise my law students all the time, don't ever let your clients go on 60 Minutes. Let your clients go on live TV. Uh, you control live TV, but never go on TV, which is edited by producers. They control what you say. So what 60 Minutes had Dagan saying was very different from what Dagan has said to me 
and what very different from what he said in other public forums. So uh, I have to understand more what he said. But I completely, I completely agree with you that you should always, always reference the IDF when talking about comparisons with the Shoah. And but after that, can we take some students? Of course. This yeah. is this yeah. is a student-oriented place. Yeah. Okay. Good idea. I think it's very important to be very short back here. And one can well understand that in a state like this, it is so essential to know that the market that's in the dark capabilities is dark and that it's about to disappear easily. But at the same time, I think we have to understand what elders of the public is an existential factor. And I'm thinking about a so called analogy. The song died in Africa in the It was succeeded by a toy. My name felt the big mistake that was revolutionary at the time. And he said, you know, the nuclear war changes the notion that we will fight a war with the West, we're going to prevail, it's inevitable. You can't think in those terms because the nuclear bomb does not know the difference between the proletariat and the in a nuclear war, we are all going to die. It is an existential threat. And consequently, I think that the Soviet Union, as a superpower, could come to the conclusion that nuclear war is an existential threat. Israel better come to that conclusion as well. I agree. And the problem, of course, is that on the other side, in the case of Iran, there isn't that sense. They do not view it as an existential threat because their existence, their theology, is tied to some sort of transcendence to another world. So there's no parallels. They cannot be a dependence. <coughs> and this is why Jews must continue to disturb. Mm -hmm. You talk about the fact that as the Jews know how to sleep. Mm -hmm. But it's the poetry of life. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's always better to have as your enemies atheists. <coughs> <laughs> Professor Siboni? Students, students. Okay. Some students. Student in the back. <laughs> so I, I know you didn't want to um, pick, pick a president or a future president in the scenario, but just watching the debates, I think it's, it's, it's important to think about what the candidates are saying. So in the vice presidential debate, for example, Biden brought up uh, or they were they brought up the, the nuclear issue in Iran, and Biden said, "Everybody just calm down. They don't have a weapon yet." And he said he turned to to Ryan and he said, "What do you want to go to war?" And Ryan said, "No, no I don't want to go to war either." And uh, I mean, Romney hasn't really said anything that would be very different from what the Obama administration wants to do. No one's really said anything more assertive about actually doing anything if. If the threat happens. Except, okay. except the President Obama has. He has said that. Had, but he, hasn't, he, he, said, he hasn't said it explicitly. He said, I won't take anything off the table. He hasn't said it in no No, no, he, he, said, said, he said Iran will, it is the policy of this administration that Iran will not be allowed to develop nuclear weapons. That policy of this administration, that containment is off the table. Look, I have to tell you, Joe Biden, uh, this is not a political night, but Joe Biden was thought to be Israel's closest friend. On the issue of Iran, he has not been following the president's policies. And I can tell you that I've made that clear uh, to everybody I've spoken to about that. And I wish he would toe the line and, and follow uh, uh, the, the administration uh, policy on, on Iran, because I agree with you. I think the administration is not speaking with one uh, clear voice. I also think the Romney camp is not speaking with one clear voice. I don't see any difference at this point in time. Uh, and that's probably a good thing in some respects. I always want Israel to be a bipartisan issue. I never want Israel to be an issue uh, which there is a referendum over when there is an election. Because when there's a referendum, you can lose the referendum. Um, we, Jeff, uh, sure. Um, you spoke about uh, Iran as an international actor. And you spoke about uh, a religious impetus for Iranian policy. And the gentleman who just spoke about um, uh, a, a sort of irrational, again, religious interest for the claims and, and threats that Iran is making. I wonder, I, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think we really discussed this evening the, the Shiite belief that the 12th Imam and Judgment Day will only come when the believers launch. <laughs> 
for Pharaoh and unbelievers. And my question is twofold. I wonder why we don't hear <coughs> us more in Western discourse when we're talking about our Indian policy. And I wonder also, in your view, um, how often is that brought up in Israeli conversation and in the defense community? Mm -hmm. well, I think you should answer that question as well. Um, uh, let me let me quickly try. First of all, um, I think we do hear about the 12th Imam, particularly Ahmadinejad, who is uh, very centrally concerned with the 12th Imam. Of course, you know there are elements within Judaism, there are elements within Christianity, there are elements within many religions that are apocalyptic. And uh, uh, but there's no government that's in power that represents that kind of apocalyptic. Uh, point of view, and that's why I think it has to be taken seriously. The point I was making before is if Iran did develop nuclear weapons, there'd be a lot of pressure within the Shia community to use the nuclear weapon to bring about the 12th Imam, to bring about the destruction of Israel. That's why, although Gates and others talk about Iran as rational actors, and there are rational actors in Iran, the question is what is their frame of reference for their rationality? You know, they do get from A to B to C. But the C is a very different C than the C we get to, and so that has to be taken into account. Yeah. Uh, I would add uh, something. Uh, what uh, frightens me is not <coughs> the risk of uh, destruction of Israel by uh, uh, nuclear weapons. I'm not afraid of that. I'm afraid of the fascination of the idea of annihilating the Jews among uh, Iranian and uh, fundamentalist establishment. There is a fascination that is, they are uh, fascinated by the, uh, the possibility to fulfill an ideal, a goal, which is totally ideal, which is to erase a people who is an objection to their text, to their identity. Mm -hmm. This, when people are fascinated, they can be totally irrational. I give you an example. There was a great philosopher, uh, Heidegger, who, who was saying uh, really interesting and deep things. And uh, when Hitler came, Heidegger has been fascinated by the Nazism because he saw the, uh, the perfection of a technique of managing men. And he took his card of the Nazi party and he kept it 10 years. You cannot follow a philosopher <laughs> like that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, fascination is a, a, a suppression of, uh, of thought. You see? So, excuse me. Uh, there is a really uh, a danger that is, uh, for that I agree mm -hmm. with you when you say he, uh, American uh, government and the uh, honest nation has to put it credible by right. the Iranian government that they will uh, do really something. And, to and if they can stop the fascination because you have to, I, I, when I said that I read the Quran deeply, I can tell you that uh, the uh, Quran has uh, integrated some uh, passages of the Bible, and he has built an, almost a new God. Allah resembles to the God of the Bible, but the God of the Bible uh, is violent against Jews, and he loves the Jewish people. He hates the Jewish people and he loves the Jewish people. And this is like life. Sometimes life, life hates you and, someti and sometimes it loves you. Which means sometimes you hate life and sometimes you love it. But the Allah 
uniquely, totally hates Jews. This is the problem. And I suggested once in a symposium to moderate Muslims to introduce a small prayer on Friday, two minutes prayer, to pray Allah to stop hating Jews and Christians. Mm -hmm. Look, the Vatican did that, and it really had an impact on Catholic thinking about anti-Semitism when they did it in Vatican II. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, if, and uh, it, this would be the symmetrical point of what you told, Michael, that you have been mm -hmm. shocked by people praying Allah to allow them, but Allah already allows. But you know, you're talking about Heidegger, and let's never forget who mm -hmm. Heidegger's mistress was and who tried to resurrect Heidegger after the end of the war, and that was the Jewish philosopher Hannah Arendt, uh, who never renounced uh, Heidegger and, and was fascinated with his Nazism. And remember, too, Gertrude Stein, uh, a, a miserable Nazi collaborator who worked with uh, Gestapo agents and who probably revealed the location of Jewish children hiding in her uh, city, and yet the museum in New York uh, has shows uh, uh, talking about her without revealing the past history. And one of the things I hope you will study when you do the study of anti-Semitism is Jewish anti-Semitism. And people like uh, Gilad Atzmon, who are Holocaust deniers and, and, and Jewish anti-Semites, and uh, uh, people who have been fascinated with Nazism and fascinated with the destruction of the Jews. Atzmon, who lives today and was recently profiled on the BBC as a great musician. By the way, he's a miserable musician. <laughs> All my friends who are jazz artists tell me he's a miserable musician. The only reason he's ever put on the air is because of his anti-Semitism. He's like a talking dog. Uh, a Jewish Israeli who is an anti-Semite, so the dog can talk. By the way, he can also play the flute, but he doesn't play it very well. <laughs> and Atzmon talked about how he can wipe Jewishness out of his soul and off the earth. And, uh, you know, this is a very serious phenomenon that we encounter uh, as, as a people. And if I can just add one point to your question, I think it's also important to realize that the current regime under Ahmadinejad the Ayatollah that they're, the, the rabbi that they hold by is a guy named Yazdi. And Yazdi, in Shiite Islam, they believe in the returning of the Iman, the 12th Iman, as you say. But like Jews pray for the coming of the Mashiach and Christians pray for the returning of the Messiah. Shiites pray for the, the, the return of the, of the Mahdi. Yazdi and Ahmadinejad and the current clique in power believe that by actions they can bring about the return of the Mahdi. So this is a break from traditional Shiite Islam where they would pray and hope for the returning of this messianic figure. These people feel through violent action that they can help bring, uh, usher in the era of the returning Mahdi. And Ahmadinejad a few years ago when he spoke at the United Nations went and uh, spoke when he returned to Iran, spoke how he felt he was bathed in a green aura, a green light, and that there was silence and nobody was blinking for the 28 minutes of his speech. People believe that he may be this character that will create chaos to usher in a period of uh, mm -hmm. messi messianic age. So these are very dangerous, uh, a very dangerous regime and, and breaks from traditional Shiite Islam. And I would also say, in terms of discourse, very, very quickly, and in terms of fascination. So here's a regime that speaks openly and widely about exterminating Jews. And this idea has permeated our discourse, it's, it's in the air. In the, it's, it's, the regime uses the, uh, its, its offices to spread the lies of the protocols. It, it, I would even argue that the, the, that the regime's anti-Semitism may pose a greater risk than the nuclear weapons program because as Chuck was saying, there is an IDF, there is a, a military means to defend Israel, but this lie is gaining traction. And I, I, I'm gonna say something that uh, don't dismiss. I would urge everybody to go back and go on YouTube tonight and look at um, Obama's speech in Cairo, where he invited the Brotherhood to attend. And he said, and, and people have said that this was a mistake. He was speaking very to a very specific audience. And he, like Ahmadinejad, 
said that the Jews are there because of the Holocaust. We have to be kind. We have to give them charity. But they're there because of the Holocaust. Not a word, not a word on the Jewish narrative and our tie, or the Jewish tie. But as you know, to he has, land. since that time, spoken repeatedly about a Jewish, uh, long time Jewish interest in Israel, about the history of Zionism, about Herzl. Um, um, and he's acknowledged, I think, uh, publicly that that was uh, a, a misstatement and he's not repeated it. Sure, I, I agree. But three years later, there's revolution sweeping the Middle East. But anyways, I, that, I, that's all I wanted to say. I, I, there's a student here, Sarah. It would be a terrible mistake for this organization to be conceived of as taking partisan views on American elections. It would mean the doom of this organization. It is absolutely essential that this organization, like CAMERA and like other organizations, remain bipartisan, not take political positions on American elections or on Israeli elections, not take political positions on Israel's uh, views on the settlements, not take political and partisan positions that will divide. You do not want to become the J Street of the right. Uh, I just caution you not to do that. Agreed. I agree for the record. Sarah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for your remarks. I wish I had heard that yesterday because I'm a student at the Kennedy School and we had a class today where the discussion of morality of warfare in Iran came up. And I made the case that Israel and the United States have the moral and the legal right, not as eloquently as you did just now, maybe you said 2% of what you said, uh, but to the class about kind of the reasons why they're morally justified and legally justified to go to war. And the professor pushed back on me saying that oh, we have to be skeptical of what they're saying. We can't take what they're saying at face value. Um, and, and so my question for you is, given that the media, I think, has almost portrayed what Ahmadinejad says as uh, a joke sometimes, how, how can we in the classroom, in the press, or in other forums um, really draw attention to how serious this is? I mean, the, the pushback the professor gave me was that it's all these hyperbolic sound bites and we have the moral obligation to be skeptical of what they're saying. So the, the question really is, how, how do we get beyond this audience that probably already agrees with what you said, or for the most part agrees with what you said, to, to, to the serious It's a great question. First of all, you have to expose what I call selective skepticism by your professors. These professors are only skeptical of some points of view and not other points of view. Uh, is your professor skeptical of Dagan? Is your professor skeptical of Gates? Or is he only skeptical of people on one side of the issue? Skepticism is a wonderful tool if it's applied universally. universally. I'm skeptical of everything, of everybody, and never accept anything on principle. But the idea of being skeptical only on one side, that's number one. Number two, skeptical means that there's a possibility it's true. So the next question is, what level of skepticism justifies action? And any professor teaching risk analysis, whether it be a medical professor dealing with when surgery is warranted and when other means are necessary, will always look at the degree of the risk discounted by the improbability of its occurrence. We'll always look at multiple factors. And when the degree of the risk is very, very high, then the level of skepticism varies with the degree of risk. Also, it depends on where you're looking at it from and what your options are. And I just think it's important to push back on your professors who use academic tools like skepticism to hide often an agenda-driven bias. And it's hard to do that uh, in class. I can just tell you what one professor did at Harvard Law School and how a student responded. Uh, Professor Duncan Kennedy uh, decided to teach a course on the Middle East crisis from a legal point of view. And Professor Duncan Kennedy, when it comes to Israel, at the time he taught the course, was an utter and total ignoramus. He had no knowledge of the Middle East uh, crisis. 
He just had a polemical point of view. He was a hard leftist, and hard leftists have to be anti-Israel. So he felt a kind of moral obligation to teach a course on the Middle East. He had no qualifications for doing it. It would be like me going to the physics department and deciding to teach a course on physics, or for a religious fundamentalist, going to the paleontology department and deciding to teach a course on evolution. But he decided to teach his course. And uh, Joel Pollack took the course and saw the, uh, uh, the syllabus. And the syllabus was not a syllabus. It was a, a, a collection of propaganda. And so he asked Professor uh, Kennedy uh, if he would allow alternative readings in the class or would invite other professors with different points of view, for example, me, to address one of the classes. And Kennedy said, no, this is my class. You read my reading. Uh, no other readings are permitted. So what Joel Pollack did was brilliant. He created an online alternate curriculum in which he urged the students to read for every article that Kennedy assigned, to read an article which presented an alternative point of view. And by the end of the semester, I think more students were accepting Pollock's alternative points of view than Professor Kennedy's uh, point of view. Professors do not have a monopoly on the truth. Uh, they have a monopoly on grading you, but fortunately we have blind grading. Now, blind grading doesn't apply in seminars, and we have had examples of students who have been not here that I know of, but in many universities graded down when they present an alternative uh, perspective. Uh, but it's remarkable how many people, Noam Chomsky is a linguist, but he teaches Middle East politics. Why? Not because he knows anything, but because he has a <laughs> strong opinion. It's teaching by opinion, and it's quite remarkable. I quite deliberately do not teach courses on the Middle East. I know much more than Duncan Kennedy and Noam Chomsky does, combined about the Middle East. I've been there many, many more times. I have more access to information, but I have opinions about the Middle East. I'm not an expert, so I don't believe myself qualified to teach such a course. I'll give lectures, as I did tonight, but these are optional lectures. I actually gave one reading group once on the Middle East through literature, and I assigned Sari Nuseba's book, I assigned uh, Amos Oz's book, and by the end of the reading group, the students were saying to me, I, th I thought you were pro-Israel. We don't see that in any of the readings. You know, you, you seem to be just giving us readings about literature. And that's, of course, what a teacher is supposed to do. Teachers are not supposed to use their podiums uh, in order to make uh, political or propaganda points. And I'm afraid that too many university podiums have been surrendered to ideologues, propagandists, uh, opinion-driven courses, ideologically driven courses, rather than intellectually neutral uh, courses where analytic skills are taught rather than propaganda results are preached. Okay, we have uh, time for one more question because we're running out of time, so please go ahead. Okay, well, that does actually segue perfectly into my question, um, which was going to be about the um, growth of the anti-Israel voice on campuses, um, both in relation, both amongst the faculty, which you've already touched on, but also amongst the students. Um, and I'm interested in your perspective on the state on American campuses. Um, I can certainly speak, I was present in the Australasian Union of Jewish Students, and it was certainly a problem that- so Say that again, you were what? Um, I was president of the Australasian Union of Jewish Students. I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, yeah. Australia. Australia, okay, right. Australia and New Zealand, you say Australasian. Um, Union of Jewish Students, well, uh, New Zealand is an extremely courageous country. It created a nuclear free zone around itself. And boy, that takes an enormous amount of courage. I love that. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> what a bunch um, of that hurts, right? Um, but I certainly know, like in the case of the UK, with the academic boycotts of Israel and, and the number of professors that you've already spoken about tonight, both here at Harvard and, and all around. Um, the states and, and amongst the student, the student population and the growth of certain student organisations and the demise of certain others. Um, could you perhaps comment on where you see the future in this regard? What does it mean long term for the support of Israel um, from its current allies? Well, it's very dangerous, and I agree with you. Uh, oh, did, I thought you finished. And, and do you um, you and Professor Cutler are becoming more of a sort of lone voice on campus. Or, or, or people like dinosaurs. Um, you know, we're, we're both in our 70s. And uh, 
we need you and uh, the future and young young people. Look, it's a mixed picture. Um, um, Peter Beinhardt has a point when he says that uh, the pro-Israel community is aging, that uh, those of us who recall 1948, 1967, 1973, 1981 are aging out, uh, that your generation of students knows Israel through the occupation, <laughs> through the intifada, through the responses to the intifada, through a range of other issues, through the Gaza flotillas, through the boycotts. It's a much, much harder case to make today than it was when I was growing up. Um, uh, Andrea Levin of Camera makes that case beautifully on, on campuses, and there are other organizations that do as well. But it's a very mixed picture. Um, I would say faculties around the country are, um, th it's not that there are more anti-Israel professors than there are pro-Israel professors. It's that anti-Israel professors are very vocal and pro-Israeli professors are cowards. Um, my big complaint is not with the anti-Israel professors. I understand Chomsky. My complaint is with the pro-Israel professors who don't have the courage or the guts to speak out because it will affect their ratings. It will affect whether they're admitted to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. It will affect their status. It will affect their marketability if they are perceived as being uh, pro-Israel. But if a Jew who is anti-Israel, or even better, an Israeli who's anti-Israel, my God, that's really a talking dog. So they should be hired to join the faculty. So there's an academic bias in favor of Jews and Israelis being anti-Israel rather than uh, pro-Israel. To, to give you a perfect example, many of you know my views on Israel. Um, I am in favor of the two-state solution. I'm very much against the settlements. I've been against the settlements since 1973. I've been in favor of two-state solutions since 1970 by Israeli standards. I'm on the left of Israel. Uh, yet in the United States on academic campuses, I'm regarded as a zio-fascist, extreme right-winger. People are surprised to hear that I'm a liberal Democrat uh, and think I'm an arch-reactionary conservative who, of course, automatically would probably vote for the most extreme right-wingers uh, on the other side. And, and, and Noam Chomsky and Norman Finkelstein are regarded as centrists. There's a whole big campaign now to resurrect Noam fin Norman Finkelstein as a centrist, as a Zionist, that he's not sufficiently anti-Zionist, so he belongs in, in the middle. And um, it's, uh, you know, on the faculty, it's very, very biased. But my, my concern is not with the anti-Israel faculty, and your job as students is to make it clear to pro-Israel faculty that they have an obligation to speak up, to speak up critically, of course, as I do critically of Israel, but to speak up. And uh, whenever I speak at universities, um, I get a phone call the next day. It usually goes something like this in a hushed voice. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dershowitz. Well, thank you, Alan, for speaking up. I say, why don't you speak up? Why are you whispering? What are you afraid somebody's going to listen to you? Uh, and they all say, we're so glad you're speaking up. But they are terrified. Look, I have to tell you, in 48 years of teaching, I have never met a less courageous group than tenured professors. <laughs> tenured professors. Uh, and tenured professors just, many of them, some do, many of them just don't have the courage of their own convictions. That's what I care about. Not that they have views different from mine, but they have views like mine, but they won't speak up. And the vocal speakers just drown out the non-vocal non-speakers. As far as the students are concerned, it's a mixed picture. There's never been more vital pro-Israel activity on college campuses today. It's amazing what's going on all over the country. Uh, how many students, both Christians and, and Jewish, are standing up for Israel. There's much more interest in Israel than there have been in, in the past on college and university uh, campuses. And there's also more vibrant anti-Israel uh, views. But in the United States, at least, we're not losing that battle among the students. In England, we are. In France, we are. In France, there's a degree of lit literally physical intimidation. In Norway, I don't know if you know this, but in Norway, I spoke in Norway last year and uh, the people who hosted me offered me to speak free at the three Norwegian universities in Bergen, in Trondheim, and in um, uh, the capital, Oslo. And um, uh, how often do they get free lectures from Harvard professors? They all three of them turned me down. One of them said, we'd love to have you talk about the O.J. Simpson case. <laughs> but we heard from Finkelstein on Israel, and so we don't really need another perspective on Israel. They wouldn't allow me to speak. Of course, we got in touch with the students, and students arranged for me 
to speak. That didn't happen in South Africa. In South Africa, I was scheduled to speak at Cape Town University, and Cape Town University canceled my talk and wouldn't allow me to speak there. They said there wasn't sufficient student interest. So we moved the speech off campus, and we had 1,400 people show up to listen to me speak. That's not sufficient interest. So you do have a lot of effort to muzzle pro-Israel speakers, even centrist pro-Israel mm -hmm. speakers, and that has to be fought and fought vigorously, and also bias in the classroom has to be fought and fought uh, vigorously. But uh, the, the job for you folks to do is to just make the case, speak out verbally, whatever your views are, make sure they're heard, make sure they're expressed, make sure you're not silenced uh, in classrooms or out of classrooms. Okay, thank you. So, I, so also, I, I, so there's a, I know there's some people with questions. If you don't mind waiting, you can stay back and maybe speak to some of the, to us or the professors if you'd like to ask a question. We, we have to leave the room. I want to, uh, first of all, thank Professor Dershowitz and Professor Siboni very much for their insights and their, their very <laughs> powerful and uh, important presentations. I would like to, in, in, uh, in response to Professor Dershowitz, and I'm not saying this to be polite, or, uh, ISGAP is dedicated to high caliber interdisciplinary research and scholarship. Um, my comments were not meant to be bipartisan. I'm actually Canadian and I cannot even, and Israeli, and I can't even vote in this election. And it's not about uh, party politics, but I think it's very important to, to understand the power of the United States and what it projects and how we see things here and how it's read in other parts of the world and the implications of that as scholars to, to decode and understand. I'm not uh, advocating that people vote one way or another. But these are things that I think are very important in this global discourse and the fascination with the Jew and the fascination <coughs> with Israel. I think these are things that we need to, in scholarship, really decode and map uh, at, at the highest levels. So in two weeks, on October the 31st, we have a, a, a prominent young scholar from, uh, from Brussels, Thomas Hochman, who's a, an expert on international law and issues of freedom of speech, and he's doing work on Holocaust, contemporary Holocaust denial and issues of freedom of speech and, uh, and that sort of thing. I think it will be a very important uh, lecture, particularly from a legal academic perspective. He's a, a young, prominent scholar, so I hope you can make it to that. We have the schedule for our events. All of our, our um, seminars across North America are actually being videotaped, so we're compiling an archive that can be accessed by net uh, at any time. So please feel free to be in contact with us, and I hope to see you at the next seminars. And thank you very much, Professor Dershowitz and Chuck Freelock.